The pro-German narrative says that the Germans didn't really have any problems, except logistical, until they got into the city of Stalingrad. Only when they entered the urban area did they lose their amazing blitzkrieg capabilities and got ground down by attritional fighting. Thus, it's Paulus' fault for entering the city, or Madman Hitler's fault as well for wanting to go there in the first place. Yet, on the eve of the city fight at Stalingrad, the German statistics show a different story. Here are six armies' divisions at this time, and they should have had 123 infantry or Panzergrenadier battalions. I'd like to point out that this doesn't include their engineer or signals or reconnaissance or Panzerjäger battalions, nor their artillery regiments and other supporting units. This is purely the infantry and Panzergrenadier battalions that were part of their infantry or Panzergrenadier regiments. But even though this isn't a complete picture, it's very revealing. On the 17th of August 1942, this is the number of battalions that these formations actually had. Excluding 22nd Panzer Division, they should have had 117 battalions, and they were down to 104. So they had lost 13 battalions at this point, meaning they were down to 84.5% of the total battalions that they should have had, excluding 22nd Panzer. Not too bad. However, these 104 battalions aren't at full strength. Many of them were only at 40 or 50% of their combat or fighting strength. Some were doing better than others. Vietersheim's corps with the 3rd and 60th motorized and 16th Panzer divisions, the top three divisions here, had Panzergrenadier battalions at around 65% in strength. But notice that the number of Panzergrenadier battalions in 3rd Motorized and 16th Panzer Divisions had decreased. They're now at 4 each, so the high percentages are only there because they condensed their men into fewer battalions. If they'd still had 6 battalions, that percentage would drop significantly. So really, 60th Motorized Division is the stronger of the three divisions in terms of Panzergrenadier battalions, which is interesting because Wiedersheim decided to use his two weaker divisions to lead the corps to the Don. Yes, 16th Panzer Division should probably go first because it has the most Panzers. But why follow it up with the weaker of the two motorized divisions, 3rd Motorized Division? Why not the healthier 60th Motorized Division? An interesting question to ask. And looking at the other divisions, we see some more interesting figures. 71st and 376 Infantry Divisions had infantry battalions as low as 31%. But at least they had their full number of battalions, even if they were all weak. By contrast, 100th Jaeger Division, not including the Croatian Legion, had not only decreased the number of Jaeger battalions they had from 6 to 4, but those 4 now had an average combat strength of just 28%. And the unit attached to 100th Jaeger Division, the Croatian Legion Regiment, was at 70% strength, but that's only because it had reduced the number of battalions from 3 to 1. So this division was battered. It was by far the weakest division in 6th Army at this point. It had suffered horribly during the battles for the Don Bend and Kalach, the battles we've just witnessed. So just by looking at these numbers, it's clear that the Axis didn't have a nice, easy stroll through the steppe on their way to Stalingrad, and then only started losing once they were in the city. No. They were already suffering outside the city. The old narrative is now both dead and buried. Alright, but there's something else going on here as well. Let's look at the number of battalions on the 24th of August 1942. The 105 battalion figure is slightly misleading, because we now have an extra 3 battalions from 22nd Panzer Division, which we didn't have before. So, if the number of battalions had remained the same, they should have been at 107 battalions. But they're not at 107, they're at 105, meaning they've lost 2 battalions. And that's true. The 376 Infantry Division is down by 1 battalion, and the 100th Jaeger Division is down by another battalion as well. All the rest are the same. 
also 100th Jager Division strength is now at 44%, but that's only because it's reduced the number of battalions from 4 to 3, not because it's received reinforcements. Some divisions did receive reinforcements though. 44th, 71st, 76th, 79th and 113th Infantry Divisions all got a boost to the strength of their battalions. However, many of the other divisions were losing strength faster than the reinforcements could replenish them. And, looking to the future slightly, it was Seidlitz's 51st Army Corps that would go into the city of Stalingrad first in order to try and take it on the march. Well, which divisions did he take into the city? He took the 71st, 295th and 389th Infantry Divisions. As we can see, 71st and 389th Infantry Divisions were at their full complement of 9 battalions each, but were at 36% and 32% strength respectively. And the 295th Infantry Division's battalions were at 65% strength, but that's only because it had 7 battalions, not 9. So this was a pretty weak force to be sending into Stalingrad in the initial attack, where you're hoping to take the city in one decisive strike. If you're trying to take Stalingrad in one decisive strike, why not swap these depleted divisions for some of the better divisions, like the 44th, the 76th or the 79th Infantry Divisions? Surely, if your priority is to take Stalingrad on the march in one decisive strike, then using your best divisions would make the most sense. And this was, indeed, the argument made in the post-war narrative, that the 6th Army's best units sat on the Don, while the weaker units went into the city. And there's some merit to this argument. They could have easily swapped these divisions out. 44th Infantry Division, for example, had marched north to take over 60th Motorized Division's position along the Don, prior to the crossing of the Don. So 44th Infantry Division could have relieved, say, the 295th Infantry Division, which in turn could have relieved 60th Motorized Division, and then we would have seen 44th Infantry Division crossing the Don and marching into Stalingrad. That option was there, and yet Paulus didn't take that option. In fact, I was going to conclude that 6th Army sent in its weakest units into the fight, Probably because Paulus didn't want to sacrifice his best units in the city, which may have been the case. That was until Anson Jolly pointed out that all of 6 Army's units were weak, and the difference between the best and the worst units wasn't actually that much. The 6th Army deemed that most of its divisions were only suitable for limited offensive tasks anyway, so the difference between the divisions wasn't that substantial. We should also remind ourselves that, at this stage, Paulus expected the city to fall rapidly. And so, from his point of view, it probably didn't matter which depleted units he used for this attack. Arguably, Paulus may not have wanted to commit the best of his weak units into the city and get them chewed up in urban warfare, and he was worried about his northern flank. But the differences were so small, and it could also be argued that none of these reasons factored into the decision. Whichever view you take, the most important thing to note is that the divisions in the 6th Army were already depleted before they got into the city fighting. And for various reasons, in the initial stages of the attack, Paulus was sending in some pretty weak units to take the city of Stalingrad. This fact alone undermines the narrative that the Germans had an easy ride up until they got into the city, and it underlines the significance of the fighting outside of the city, which has been neglected for too long. As the Soviets counterattacked the Germans in the Kotlaban region, to the west, 11th Army Corps was still under pressure from Moskalenka's 1st Guards Army. The Germans had to commit two separate panzer detachments, as well as the 22nd Panzer Division, to halt the ongoing Soviet attack. And even further west, the 812th Rifle Regiment of 304th Rifle Division moved across the Don to the eastern flank of the 14th Guards Rifle Division. 
Reacting to this, the Savoy Cavalry Regiment counterattacked this new unit, causing heavy casualties on the Soviet riflemen. The Soviets also claim to have killed 500 Italians in this action. But this claim is clearly an exaggeration because the Italians had only lost 120 killed and wounded by the 1st of September in seven days' time. In contrast, by the 1st of September, the 304th Rifle Division had lost 94 killed, 351 wounded, and 603 missing, indicating that the Soviet side were the losers of this engagement. And it's worth pointing out that, as this battle shows, Italian formations were not necessarily the pushovers that some have claimed they were. In the right circumstances, they could be quite effective and could hold their own. And so it's worth bearing this in mind as we move forward. Worrying though for the Axis, the Germans detected Plieve's 3rd Guards Cavalry Corps, which had begun to cross over the river. This fresh commitment of forces had the potential to overwhelm Axis units in the area, and Plieve would be ready to launch his attack on the next day, the 25th. Would the Axis be able to react in time? To the south, in the morning, the 71st Infantry Regiment, supported by the 129th Panzer Battalion, attacked the railway line between the 74 km and Tingutta railway stations. Meeting little resistance, they easily captured the area by mid-morning. With that mission fulfilled, Fremery's units in this area were ordered to move east to join the rest of the division's units in the lake area, where they could guard the army's right flank. This would also relieve elements of the 24th Panzer Division, allowing them to move north and also rejoin the bulk of their division. The Romanians also seem to have been attacking, although details are scarce. Chubikov says he was sent out by Shumilov to see what was happening around Ivanovka. He drove from there towards Vasilevka, where he and his driver suddenly found themselves in no man's land and being shot at by the enemy. Now, Chuikov says they were Germans, but unless he has the date wrong, it's most likely that it was Romanian troops who were firing at him. Either way, they missed, and Chuikov managed to get back to his own lines. However, he happened to be wearing a non-Soviet coat, and the riflemen of the 157th Rifle Division looked upon him suspiciously. Had I not spoken to them in colloquial Russian, we would probably have been met with hand grenades, and my raincoat would have been riddled with machine gun bullets. After this, Chuikov helped direct the division's artillery, which scattered the Romanians moving in the area. And with the help of Kurapatienka, a counterattack was organized, and the Soviets managed to retake the villages of Vasilevka and Kapkinsky. Otherwise, not much happened in the south, and this is understandable since both sides had their problems. By this point, some of the Soviet units were in such a terrible state that they were no longer combat worthy. As Falk describes in his book, The 64th Army at Stalingrad, between the 126th and 29th Rifle Divisions was the Siberian 208th Rifle Division. Battered by its previous combat and still in the line, this division was down to just 502 men. It had no mortars or artillery either, since they'd all been lost, and only six anti-tank guns left. Well, as the Axis assaulted their lines on this day, it was decided to reinforce the 126th Rifle Division with two cadet schools, a guards mortar regiment, and allow the division to absorb the remaining troops of the 208th Rifle Division. The 208th wouldn't formally disband until November, but for all intents and purposes, it now ceased to exist. Let us remind ourselves that the 208th Rifle Division had only entered combat on the 2nd of August 1942, after having many of its troop trains blown up by Stuka attacks as the division made its way to the battlefield. It was disbanded in practice on the 24th of August 1942, so it had lasted 22 days. A testament to the ferocious fighting that we've witnessed so far. But of course, this battle has barely begun. In fact, Hot was now planning a new attack in which he hoped to finally reach the city of Stalingrad, which we still haven't got to yet. 
The aim of this new attack, which would begin on the next day, the 25th of August, was to occupy the high ground northeast of Ivanovka in order to allow a subsequent thrust northwest towards Paulus's army. So, to give as much support to this attack as possible, the 371st Infantry Division was pulled out of the line and sent north, followed shortly by the 94th Infantry Division. Also, as preparation for this, Hauenschelt reorganised his division. The 24th Schutzen Brigade was now in command of the division's two Panzergrenadier regiments, while 24th Panzer Regiment, with 85 Panzers at this time, was allowed to operate independently. The 243rd Sturmgeschütz Battalion was also in support of Hauenschelt's division, but even with this help, it was clear that the 24th Panzer Division wouldn't be able to advance until Heim's 14th Panzer Division had attacked first and moved up to where 24th Panzer Division was. So Heim would attack first at 0500 hours, once elements of the 371st Infantry Division had moved into the line and freed up Heim's units. Kempf had about 160 tanks, plus more tank destroyers and Stugs, in 14th and 24th Panzer Divisions. And what's worth noting is that, not only was there an ammunition shortage at this time, but there was a shortage of practically everything. Urgently necessary, lubricant, grease, tyres, supply of Panzer engines, general replacement parts for new type vehicles, suspension springs, bolts and nuts. Still, the Germans had more tanks than their enemy. At this point, 13th Tank Corps had just 37 tanks. And while there were some other depleted tank brigades in the area, many of the Soviet tanks here had actually been transported half complete from Stalingrad and were without engines. But even so, the general lack of tanks on the German side was going to be a problem, since they were the ones who were attacking. With the Germans bogged down in the Stalingrad region and in the Caucasus, and with Foul Blau unraveling before their eyes, tensions were high at the Führer's headquarters. Soviet troops were currently launching unceasing attacks at Rzhev, and Halder now advised Hitler to have the 9th Army fall back to a more defensive line. You always come here with the same proposal, that of withdrawal. I demand from the leadership the same toughness as from the frontline soldiers. I have the toughness, my Führer, but out there brave musketeers and lieutenants are falling in thousands and thousands as useless sacrifice in a hopeless situation simply because their commanders are not allowed to make the only reasonable decision and have their hands tied behind their backs. What can you, who sat in the same swivel stool in the First World War, tell me about the troops, Herr Halder? You, who don't even wear the black insignia of the wounded. Halder later sulked in his diary. Führer Situation Conference. Sharp clash over interpretation of the situation at Rzhev, where I perceive a distinct danger of attrition for our forces. So, yes, things weren't going well in Hitler's court. But the situation wasn't much better on the Soviet side. At 2100 hours on the 24th of August 1942, Khrushchev, Churyanov, Malyshev and Vasilevsky watched as Yeremenko sent his daily report of the situation to Moscow. The previous evening, Vasilevsky had only managed to send two short reports to Stalin, who hadn't taken them so well. Now he was about to get the full report, and at 2300 hours, each of these men grimly signed their signatures to the report, which was then sent to Moscow. Now, earlier in the day, Lopatin had asked both Yeremenko and the Red Army General Staff if he could withdraw. And having not got a reply, at midnight he sent in his own report, in which he once again asked if he could withdraw. Well, Stalin, who always worked late into the night, read Lopatin's report and agreed with it. So he told Vasilevsky that Lopatin should withdraw to the K defensive line. The problem was that Yeremenko and Vasilevsky were slow to reply to Lopatin, and had previously issued orders for a counterattack, 
prompted by Stalin's earlier messages. So, having still not got a message from Yeremenko or Vasilevsky, in the end, Lopatin decided to just follow his previous orders and reported to Yeremenko that he was going to try to conduct another counterattack. Stalin also read this new report and was angry that one of his army commanders had no clear instruction from above and couldn't decide what to do. Stalin therefore turned his criticism to Yeremenko and Vasilevsky, arguing that they had failed to establish a decent defence and that their badly conducted counterattacks had done little more than waste their forces. Since they couldn't decide what to do, Stalin decided for them and ordered Yeremenko to counterattack once again. The point is that, at this moment, the Soviet commanders were confused, indecisive, and were issuing conflicting orders. They'd lost both command and control of the situation. And, despite the lack of tanks, Hot's attack had just begun. Kemp's force advanced towards Solyanka and Ivanovka, with Heim starting first as previously agreed. However, what Hot and Kempf hadn't realised was that they were now striking into the positions of the next line of defences, the Stalingrad K defensive line. The K line occupied the dominant hilly terrain and contained extensive minefields, entrenched AT and machine guns, bunker positions and strong field fortifications. Determined Russian infantry formations were occupying these positions and backing them up were numerous artillery units. It was no wonder that by 0805 hours, 14th Panzer Division was reporting Heavy combat with enemy tanks at hills 107.4 to 115.8 All Panzer IV long barrels knocked out All Panzers except 5 are knocked out 24th Panzer Division staying to cover the flank to the west Advisable for 24th Panzer Division to continue further to the north Clearly, this wasn't a good start to Hot's new attack. Because 14th Panzer Division had met tough Soviet resistance, 24th Panzer Division began its advance earlier than expected, slicing between the 422nd and 244th Rifle Divisions of 57th Army. But they also became bogged down in minefields, as Soviet artillery blasted them from all directions. Eventually, they did get through the mines, and 14th Panzer Division did catch up to them. However, their advance didn't go very far, and was stalled in the face of stubborn Soviet resistance. During our advance on Stalingrad, my tank had been knocked out by the Russians five times. We were hit, it sounded as if you were inside a bell that got hit with a hammer, and I didn't know what to do. Five lives were at stake. In a short moment, I yelled into my throat microphone, OUT! OUT! because we had been hit in the turret. Except for the driver, we all made it out of the tank and were lying behind it on the safe side of the tank. Then they hit the tank a second time. Three of the crew members and myself survived. The driver had died. At 14.10 hours, Howenschelt told 48th Panzer Corps, Bulk of division in hard fighting. This combat is extremely bitter and costly and will continue the entire day. Panzer Regiment still has 13 Panzers. One Russian tank was hit 10 times without success. Three were shot up. Two others withdrew on fire. Also interesting is this. The Grenadiers were amazed to discover that some of the enemy units employed here wore First World War uniforms. Heavy casualties, the loss of many of their panzers, and Soviet counterattacks with 12 tanks from 6th Tank Brigade in support persuaded Hauenschelt that the attack was doomed. After a conversation with Hauenschelt that evening, Hot called off his entire offensive. And this is definitely worth emphasising. Hot's 4th Panzer Army had failed to go anywhere, and Shumilov's and Tulbukin's armies had successfully defended against them. So let's just zoom out and look at the bigger picture for a moment. From the German perspective, it's hard to ignore the fact that, in this first attack on the city of Stalingrad, it was Hot who let the side down. Compared to Paulus's 6th Army, 4th Panzer Army had achieved very little in the past few weeks, 
and that was despite receiving additional forces, including one Panzer Division from the 6th Army. And yet, in the books, we don't hear much criticism of Hort. When Paulus makes a mistake, he gets called weak, cautious and indecisive. And yet, he was the first to get to the city of Stalingrad. And up to this moment, Paulus had done more damage to the Soviets, and had taken more ground, and was dealing with more issues, and a longer front, with more divisions under his belt, than Hot was doing. And yet, it was Hot who fails to go anywhere. But where's the criticism of Hot? Where's the harsh accusations of weakness, just like with Paulus? There isn't any. Or very little. The obvious conclusion is that the neglect of the fighting outside of the city in the July and August period results in authors missing this crucial development to the south. Shifting the blame to Paulus rather than to Hart, who certainly deserves some of the criticism too. It's not hard to imagine that things could have been different had Hart broken through to the north on the 24th or the 25th of August, racing into the rear areas of the 62nd and 64th armies. This could have been a disaster for the Soviets outside the city, and may have meant less forces inside the city, allowing the Axis to take it on the march. Obviously there's no way to know if that would have happened or not, but the point is that it wasn't Paulus who failed here, it was Hot. And by the same token, Shumilov and the Soviets really deserve the bulk of the credit for this. Shumilov and his army did the majority of the work, and successfully stopped Hot in his tracks. Chuikov gets praise later for his defence of Stalingrad, and that's fine. But up until this moment, Shumilov is really the one Soviet commander who seems to have kept his own army in control, and probably the only one who was able to check the Axis forces that he faced. Even Chuikov had failed to do that when he was in command of the 64th Army earlier in the battle. Six Army's forces around Abganyereva managed to keep the situation under control. Within the confines of the maneuver battle between the Don and the Volga, the enemy's advance in three weeks of back and forth fighting around a railway siding in the middle of the steppe was minimal. Of course, Tolbukhin gets some praise as well. They did not know it at the time, but a significant defensive victory had just been won by forces under the command of General Shumilov and General F.I. Tolbukhin of the 57th Army. They had successfully stopped the major German advance from the south. And obviously the heroism, and in some cases desperation, of the Soviet troops fighting to hold the line deserves praise too. But really, Shumilov is probably the man of the hour here. Still. Hot does seem to have learned from his mistakes. Speaking to his chief of staff, Oberst Fangor, Hot said, We have to approach the matter in a different way, Fangor. We're bleeding ourselves in front of these damned hills. It's no battlefield for panzer units. We must regroup and attack at a completely different spot far from here. And indeed, they would do so. To the west, on the 25th of August, the situation was rapidly deteriorating for the Axis, under attacks by the 304th Rifle and the 5th and 6th Guards Cavalry Divisions. The Italians were either forced back or decided to withdraw, it's not clear which. Either way, this annoyed the Germans and soured relations between the Italians and the 17th Army Corps. There was now a 20 km wide gap in the line which the Germans were rushing to fill. The town of Serafimovich, which had been fought over for weeks, was now abandoned to the Soviets, freeing up units to go west. The gap was partially filled, and the situation stabilised for the day. But it wasn't the Axis that had stopped the Soviets. What's interesting is that it was at this very moment that Kuznetsov decided to halt his attacks and consolidate his positions. It's not clear why this decision was made, but it allowed additional reinforcements to arrive. 6th Army's only real reserve in the area was the 22nd Panzer Division. This was a pretty interesting division, equipped with Czech tanks, and would play an important role later in the Battle of Stalingrad. For now though, its task was to protect the Don flank, and Hitler himself ordered it to plug the gap between the Italian and German armies. 
twenty second panzer division therefore began to pull itself out of the line and started riding west to fulfill its duty. This left eleventh army corps to deal with the soviets in their area, which in the evening struck at the german and croatian lines. One company of the Croatian Legion panicked and fled, leaving behind some heavy equipment and abandoning a hill they had occupied. The Croatians, supported by the 227th Jäger Regiment and two Stugs from the 177th Sturmgeschütz Battalion, managed to retake the hill by dawn, after an overnight struggle, and the situation was stabilised for now. But north of Kalach on the 25th of August, 51st Army Corps, 71st Infantry Division, assaulted across the Don River, suffering 32 men killed and 153 wounded over the course of the day. But this forced 62nd Army's 399th and 131st Rifle Divisions to fall back, and the German division was now firmly across the river. Reacting to this, Lopatin asked Yeremenka if he could withdraw his left wing to the Roshoshka River. But Yeremenka, preparing the Kovlenka and Shetevnev counterattacks, denied Lopatin's request. And he was probably right to do so, since Stalin was still frustrated with both Yeremenka and Lopatin for the failure of their previous counterattacks, and authorizing another withdrawal was probably the wrong political move. Somehow, both generals managed to soothe Stalin's temper by the mid-afternoon, and at 1500 hours, Stalin sent another message saying, if Lopatin thought it could succeed, then he would support him in that next attack. I propose to help him fulfill that decision. In this regard, our morning directive concerning the withdrawal of 62nd and 64th armies cannot be considered obligatory. So, supported by 270 sorties from the 8th Air Army, Yeremenka's forces attempted to smash the Germans in their northern pockets. However, 270 sorties were simply not enough to combat German air superiority, and the fact that Wietersheim's men were trapped in a pocket caused Richthofen to shift the focus of his attacks. He diverted forces from the bombing of Stalingrad city and instead turned them north. As Yeremenka's shock groups concentrated for the attacks, German Stukas unmercifully pounded his troops throughout the entire duration of these attacks, disrupting their combat formations and hindering their timely reaction to altered situations. As a result, the assaults, when they occurred, were late, disorganized and poorly coordinated. The Luftwaffe claimed 11 Soviet tanks destroyed, and 12 artillery pieces, although at one point they also bombed their own troops, probably because the front line was all over the place and they couldn't tell who was who. Still, Group Kovalenka tried in vain to dislodge 3rd Motorized Division, but was repulsed, losing 35 tanks in the process. To the south of the pocket, 2nd Tank Corps attacked again. By this time, however, the Germans had prepared their defences, and Kravchenka barely went a few hundred metres. So, at midday, Kravchenka ordered his tanks to consolidate the hard-won ground that they had gained, and waited for reinforcements to arrive. The result of this unusually cautious approach to combat from the Soviet side had only resulted in the loss of six Soviet tanks, and 2nd Tank Corps remained a major thorn in Wietersheim's side. And this thorn was made worse by the fact that German troops in the pocket were now running out of ammunition. Once again, urgently request air supply and ammunition and fuel. Panzer 5cm and 7.5cm ammunition for long barrels, critical. Columns no longer getting through. Airdrop once again urgently requested. Paulus gave this final message to Richthofen when he and Paulus met that day, and Richthofen promised aerial resupply in the afternoon. As it happened, the Luftwaffe did conduct supply drops that evening, but most of the canisters fell into no man's land or into Soviet hands, which clearly wasn't good. What's interesting though is that, while Wiedersheim's force was surrounded and running out of ammunition, the 16th Panzer Division had the time and ammunition spare to fire at boats that were crossing the river. 
In the past few days, they'd already sunk several boats carrying civilians over the Volga, and on this day, they got another. On their third evening, German panzers sank a paddle steamer taking women and children from the city to the east bank. Hearing screams and cries for help, soldiers asked their commander if they could use some of the prisoners' inflatable boats to rescue them. But the lieutenant refused. We know how the enemy fights this war, he replied. After night had fallen, the panzer crews pulled their blankets up over their heads so that they did not hear the cries anymore. The 160th Panzer Battalion was still trying to break through to Wiedersheim, but was also coming under attack from the 35th Guards Rifle Division and 169th Tank Brigade, and was unable to advance at all. It was now that Paulus was beginning to realise that there weren't enough forces in the area to break through to Wiedersheim or complete the original goal of securing Stalingrad on the march. So, for now, he ordered Rodenberg to form Kampfgruppe Kegler which would be spearheaded by Hoon's 160th Panzer Battalion. Kegler was ordered to break through to Borodkin, get supplies through to Wiedersheim, then withdraw, since securing the area with so few forces would be impossible. Therefore, the formations began assembling around Hill 137.2 that evening, with the attack planned to start at 0400 hours the next day. We'll see if they can break through or not next time. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.